innovation, co-creation and innovation for engineering the products. Focused efforts for developing key technical capabilities in the country. We have Mr. Dan, Director Global Cyber Security Resource, Carlton University, Canada as the moderator. And in the panelist, uh, in the panelist we have uh, Mr. Echir Alter, Head of Cyber Security Sector, Israel Export Institute. Mr. Dhruv, Dhruv Khanna, CEO and Founder of Data Resolve. Mr. Tarun Viz, Founder in a few labs. I invite you all to join on the stage. So I, I hand over the session to Dr. Ja Dan. So you can use that mic. I'll stand here. I don't mind standing in there okay. if that's okay. I'd like, to, I'd like to move around. So hello, everybody. Welcome. Uh, my name is Dan Craig, and I am from, uh, from Canada, um, that uh, country which is, you know, very important in the cybersecurity world. We're going to try to make that uh, actually true at, at some point uh, in, in the future. So we are here today to talk about uh, co-creation. And as I look at the notes that were given to me with respect to this, they're primarily talking about co-creation between uh, product developers, development groups, and uh, the end user. And uh, the argument appears to be in part that uh, there's been a kind of a silo, a split between those two groups, and therefore you're not getting the adoption and the, uh, and the kinds of products that people actually need. I'm going to abstract that a little bit and say that we need more than just discussions between users and, uh, and, and developers, though that is an absolutely crucial aspect for anything to be successful. But you want to talk about co-creation between communities that are globally based as well. Uh, given an issue like cybersecurity, which I'll get back to in a few moments, it has to be a global uh, problem, it needs to be uh, a global challenge, and needs to be globally resolved, and we need to be working together to do that. Um, so. I put all my notes on my phone, so hopefully the battery won't go dead on me. So um, the, the general structure is I'll give a quick introduction here. We'll have the three panelists uh, um, um, also then give a bit of an introduction about what they are about. Uh, hopefully just from that, we'll have a bit of a conversation amongst ourselves about whatever issues uh, came up. Um, and then uh, we'll see what questions you have. And uh, if you don't have any questions, I've actually made up some questions that I, I'm, I'm sure will irritate people, and therefore we can have some fun for, uh, for, the, for the time that we're here. Um, so we have the four participants that you see are back there. I've already been introduced, so I don't need to introduce myself. And uh, I would really appreciate it when I mispronounce names that uh, <laughs> they're corrected. So uh, Akiad Alter? Yes, excellent. <laughs> so he's the cybersecurity uh, unit manager at the Israeli Export Institute. Uh, this is a cybersecurity unit, is a joint venture between the Israeli National Cyber Bureau and the Prime Minister's office. I have the Ministry of Economic and then it stops. Is, is that actually right or is it economic development or something? No, no, Ministry of Economic, believe me, it's, it's a bit, it's, it's been changed in the several years. Yeah. So let's say it's economic and, in, and industry. And industry, and okay. And then the Israeli Export Institute. So I'll be joining IEI. He has spent almost a decade at uh, the Israeli Defense Forces elite units up in the, uh, in the intelligence core. Uh, they used to be up by Tel Aviv, is that uh, where you were? Yeah. And they're all getting moved down to Beersheba <laughs> uh, in, in, uh, soon, I believe. Um, Aki had joined IEI on 2012 as a marketing specialist in the Homeland Security sector. Uh, in 2014, he established a cyber unit at the Export Institute, which grew significantly throughout the years and now consists more of 300 active cyber companies. What's really interesting about Israel, it's a small country. They have, I think it is, about 10% of the global market in cybersecurity. And you know, so they've put a lot of effort into this space. And, and there's a number of interesting reasons, which I think are somewhat unique to Israel, for them to be able to, to do what they do. Dhruv Khanna, pronounced right? Yeah. Uh, with over 16 years of experience in enterprise security and privacy service industry, Dhruv is an executive management alumnus from IIMC, which is an Indian college of? 
Institute of Management. Thank you. Um, successfully leading to build a robust environment to achieve a cyber-secure Indian market. Uh, before joining Data Resolve, Dhruv was associated with IBM for six years, an India-South Asia service line leader for security and privacy services. And I know that Data Resolve does have a booth outside, so uh, if he really interests you when you talk, let's hear him, please go out and visit his booth and uh, see what else do they have in, in offer. And uh, Tarun Wig, excellent. Yeah, excellent, good. No, I'm, it's amazing for me three for three. It's usually zero for three. <laughs> is the uh, co-founder of Innofew, okay. um, a research-oriented information security consulting group specializing in meeting the information security needs of the consumer via specialized products and services. And that actually fits very much into uh, the charter of, uh, of this discussion. Um, he didn't send me anything more, so I had to go rate his LinkedIn page uh, to see what he really was about. And uh, so he views himself as an entrepreneur who likes to take calculated risks. He sold off his first venture after three and a half years and the first uh, round of, of funding. And as LinkedIn, who needs updated, um, talks about him getting ready to create a company, which is, I think, in a few. So um, time to update that LinkedIn page. <laughs> So uh, that's, that's the speakers that you have in front. So uh, two folks from India, one from Israel, those are the three I's, and then you have Canada uh, as well. So even though I'm, gonna, I'm a moderator, uh, I did actually want to take a position, so I'm going to take a, a, a position. Um, as noted, I'm the director of the Global Cybersecurity Resource, which means nothing to any of you, and probably shouldn't mean nothing to you, because it's really a project that started about three months ago. And uh, the, the driving force behind it is that, uh, there's a couple of driving forces, but one of them is that we view cybersecurity as being a kind of a global challenge. And for that global challenge to be addressed, it really needs communities from around the world to work together to come up with, um, with uh, new approaches, new solutions. Um, I have here as my first uh, note, just to try to rankle people, is that as far as I'm concerned, cybersecurity is broken. When you take a look at what's going on in the world today, we're not doing our jobs, okay? Uh, we have a President Trump, perhaps, partly because of uh, what appears to be Russian hacking. If you go into the New York Times article of a couple of days ago, they give a pretty detailed discussion of uh, how that all happened. Yahoo today just admitted that they lost a billion uh, you know, a billion email related um, addresses, passwords, uh, privacy questions, and all that. You know, the scale of this thing is, is huge. You know, so you've got a tax on dem democratic institutions, you've got a tax on infrastructure, you have a tax uh, acquiring a large amount of data. It's just clear we're not doing things right. So we have to fix that in some way. So, part of what we're trying to do with, um, with us is we want to bring together communities. And that's part of the reason why I'm here in India. I've been visiting various places with one of my colleagues from Carleton in the interest of building a network which is going to be empowered by a, a, a software that we're actually developing that will allow folks in different countries to work together on research projects, to access, uh, access courses, um, to, uh, you know, just to, to work as, a, as an ecosystem in moving forward on, on the cybersecurity uh, file. And we're a bit focused personally on the, on, on the startup part of the world. You know, the way I get measured ultimately on the, on the contracts we have is am I creating jobs, am I creating uh, businesses in, in the Ottawa area. Other folks, other nodes of our network may have different views. They may just be trying to build talent in a certain place. In Nigeria, for example, that's their desire. They just want to be able to, to, to contact, connect out with international for, forces folks um, and you know access mentors access experts access uh, 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 courses so that they can improve the talent base that they have locally other places perhaps like parts of India here some of the universities especially the private universities are looking for differentiators and uh, this is a potential differentiator to attract uh, um, attract uh, students others may just be straight economic uh, development so um, we're a lot about understanding very much about entrepreneurism, about open source, about cybersecurity, and we're looking ourselves, we're looking at the intersection of those three, and that's where we view ourselves as being our sweet spot. Having spoken probably for too long, that still says 12 o'clock, so obviously I haven't talked at all, so that, that's, uh, I'll, I'll keep going. <laughs> <laughs> see so um, anyway, uh, time flies. Anyway, um, 
Could we start with Dhruv? And I just want to go through the, the direction I've had. You're welcome to come up here or use the mic. Thank you so much, Dan. <coughs> Good morning, guys. Um, so when we talk about co-creation for technical competence, uh, I am specifically going to focus on the role governments have to play to increase the state of technical competence in the country. Now, the first question that I start with, why is it required? You know, why does government have to really play a role to develop technology competence? Uh, so I'll mention a few facts here. In 2013, and this is a fact from Ministry of Finance, India's total IT turnover was $86.14 billion. And that was with a manpower of 1 crore, or 10 million people. Microsoft, if you check out their audit reports, in 2013, one single company had a turnover of $77.16 billion, with a manpower of 99,000 employees. You see the difference? Our economic security is completely dependent upon, see we already, as, as a country, as India if I speak about it, we lost out on the industrial revolution. Uh, we are importing most of our defense procurement is being done from outside. <clears throat> we have a chance, we are supposed to be the software powerhouse of the world. But if we lose on the cyber revolution as well, we are again going to become the largest importer of cyber security products from across the world. So as for, for the economic security of a country, I believe that government has a role to play. On another aspect, if we talk about national security, our government keeps talking about, <coughs> I'm sorry, so our government keeps talking about cyber being the next, next front of warfare. The next warfare would be fought on the cyber front, right? Can you fight a war with foreign mercenaries? Today, if we have a war with our neighbors, would we depend upon US, Russian or Chinese soldiers to fight that war for us? If we can't expect that to happen, then how can you depend your critical infrastructure to use products which you cannot rely upon. The government came up with a mandate that they would, they I think funded IISC Bangalore to come up with a security module for hardware products to figure out whether the hardware, the router that you're using has a big backdoor inside it or not. What has happened to that initiative? As of now it is shelved. They came out with a set of guidelines and that's all about it. So in terms of economic security as well as national security, the government does have a role to play, <clears throat> at least where the cyber security product industry is concerned. Certain examples which I can quote from around the world, InQtel. So I don't know if you guys have heard about InQtel, most of you would have heard about it. I mean, this is a cyber security gathering anyway. So InQtel, for those of you who do not know, uh, is a CIA funded VC fund. So CIA set up a fund called InQtel, it's mentioned on their website, no confidentiality here. They set up a fund called InQtel to identify young technology companies from across the United States and fund them for technologies which can be used by CIA. Some of the first few companies they funded, Google, Facebook, Palantir for that matter, I'm sure Palantir is a name well known to all of us. So these are few companies which InQtel funded and now these are global leaders. Another example, Israel for that matter, as Dan just mentioned, Israel has you know, got 10% of the market share of cyber security products across the world. And that could not have happened until and unless uh, it's unit 8213, if I'm not wrong, the unit 8213 of Israel Mossad, which basically, you know, the board of directors of most of cybersecurity companies come from that unit. China is another perfect example. You know, you have Huawei, you have ZT. Till 2006, 2007, nobody had heard about Huawei. Today, they compete with and actually beat up Cisco in most parts of the world. So these are certain examples of organizations of countries which have taken initiatives you know, which have actually played a role in co-creation, worked with their industries and gotten substantial results. The last, the last point which I like to ponder upon, how can, what role can the government play? So we were recently, you know, were, the question is, I meet a lot of government officers, they say, what can we do? Now, government has set up a 10,000 crore fund for cyber security product industry. They are supposed to fund cyber security products inside the country. As of now, and I am in this space for past 10 and a half years now, or maybe even more. As of now, I have not come across a single company which has been funded by that fund. If there is anybody in this room who knows about a company which has been funded by that fund, you know, I would like to be corrected here. As of now, they have been funding Academia. Academia anyways gets funds from DIST. Was the whole point in setting up a fund <clears throat> for promoting entrepreneurship when you're not gonna promote or fund startups? I was recently at the Express IT Awards in Bangalore, where there was a huge debate upon, uh, you know, what is the level playing field? 
why should we give protectionism to our cyber security product companies? You know, that's protectionism. That's against WTO policies. Why should we do that? <laughs> now, the challenge here is how do you define a level playing field? You have a company in Pune called Zoho, if I'm not wrong, which is competing with something in Google Apps, right? Which is competing with Google Apps. Google has been funded by US NSA. Everybody knows that. Zoho has not got any funding from the government of India. So how do you define a level playing field? Now, that is a point which government really needs to focus on. The government really needs to take initiatives. We are losing this cyber warfare as we speak. The government needs to take an initiative. They need to enter the field. They need to, we talk about Make in India, we talk about Startup India. Those policies have to filter down. Till the time those policies do not filter down, you are talking about a scenario where, as I mentioned earlier, we would become the largest cyber security importer, cyber security product importers inside the world, in the, in the, in the world. So that was my viewpoint. I think we'll uh, hold for questions later. I think I've crossed my limit anyway. So I think Dhruv, or you that. If everybody is standing, so I will stand also. Uh, so thank you very much to my colleagues here. Like uh, I mentioned, my name is Achiad. It's uh, even for Israel, it's hard to pronounce my name, so don't take it uh, the wrong way. Uh, I'll do it quickly. I'll even um, give you a bit more time for question later on. Uh, but like I mentioned, like uh, Dan has mentioned, my name is Achiad. Uh, I'm in charge. I'm the head of the cybersecurity at the Israel Export Institute. The Israel Export Institute is a non-profit organization owned by the government of Israel. Uh, if we were talking about what the government can do, I will elaborate a bit more. Uh, my, main, my main role is to know the Israeli industry in the cybersecurity area. I have met with, with more than 350 Israeli companies. Most of them are startups, um, which are mostly in the beginning of the way. Uh, they are looking, they have a solution. They have, uh, most of the entrepreneurs that uh, we have in Israel have gained a lot of experience throughout the, the military service. Most of them have, uh, uh, I don't know if you know, but in Israel, we have a mandatory service in the army, in the, in the military, I'm sorry. Uh, most of the entrepreneurs come, come out of uh, intelligence unit, elite intelligence unit, after they have served, them, uh, served for a couple of years, they have gained a field proven experience. I don't know if you know, but Israel is, uh, is that small. Uh, Population-wise, I think it's uh, three times Delhi, something like that, and the population is eight million altogether, uh, and we are surrounded by enemies. So in the beginning, we had to, uh, uh, to fight our way and to be um, always in the forefront of technology. It began from physical security, and nowadays it's on cybersecurity. And we always need uh, uh, to invest a, a lot of effort in this field and to, get, and to be in, really in the forefront and to be ahead of our enemies. And this is why I think in Israel we have a lot of uh, innovation and a lot of technology uh, related to the cyber uh, sector. And this is why we have a lot of entrepreneurs and a lot of cybersecurity companies. And I think uh, that without the government support, we could not have been where we are now. You mentioned that 10% of the world sales uh, in, in this field comes from Israel. 20% of the investment worldwide in cybersecurity companies come to Israel. Think about it. We are really, really, really small. It's a really small company, a company, really small country. And I think that says a lot about it. And what gives us the advantage uh, is, I think, the government support. Dan, you mentioned before Be'er Sheva. Uh, Be'er Sheva is, a sm is a s also a small city uh, compared to, of course, to India. Uh, one hour from the main city, Tel Aviv. Uh, where is there? We have a really wonderful ecosystem. And when I'm talking about ecosystem, I'm talking about the military is there, the academy is there, and the private sector is there. All the multinational companies there, like uh, uh, IBM, EMC, RSA, etc., uh, all together are sitting, eating lunch, talking, exchanging ideas. And behind, uh, uh, and on top of all of them, we've got the government support there. Uh, the government gives a tax reduction to companies that open office there. Uh, they're trying to encourage them to employ 
uh, to take employees there uh, to work for their companies, to take employees from the university that finished their, their degree. Uh, they get money from the chief scientists of Israel in order to promote the startup there. So I think the ecosystem in Israel is a very unique a unique kind, and, and I think that without, you know what, let's take an example uh, of what happened in Sony Pictures. I think that everybody here in the audience knows the accident that happened a couple of years ago uh, with Sony and, uh, and, and North Korea. And think about it, it was an attack on a private company, private hold company, nothing to do with the government, but it was an attack that originated from a country. And I'm not sure that a, a private company can defend itself against resources that a country has. And this is a question that I think a lot of the government and are dealing with, and I think also India should, uh, should face it. If the, if the government should help the private sector in order to better protect the industry, uh, to be more protected against cyber attacks, because in the past, you need to have a physical contact in order to attack a country or a, 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 an industry. But these days, you can be in the west coast of the United States, you can be in China, you can be in Australia or New Zealand, it doesn't matter. You only need a computer and a connection to the internet in order to cause damage. So I think it's something that not only a government of one state should think about it, but the government of most of the states, most of the states that want to defend themselves and to want to be protected against an attack worldwide. And I think we can answer a bit of the question later on, but this is the main point that I wanted to, uh, to say. So um, I will stop at this moment. I think I'm on time, right? Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. And uh, I would like to extend my sincere thanks to DSCI team first. I think this is one of the first uh, program we have been debating this particular thing that we should do something uh, more with respect to talking about how this ecosystem can be evolved, right? And I think this is one of the first uh, session we are having this year, right? Uh, and thanks to the uh, panelists. I think uh, they have enlightened us uh, with the entire aspect of co-creation. Uh, I run a product company, right, and I, I'll go with the ground reality of experience, right, about the co-creation, right, the way we look at the market. I think there are three fundamental things uh, we need to look at it. Uh, one, definitely, uh, you can build a great organization, right, but end of the day, the success of the organization is lies with the customers, right, their delight, their comfort, right, how happy they are, right. And uh, while we are building it, it should flow back to the organization, right? So what I meant to say that when we are building an organization, right, when we're building a product, right, it has to be in line of what customer wants. So while we were building it, one of the things which you realize that we will not going to benchmark us against where the market is, where the competition is. And this is one of the things you would all disagree, right? Because a lot of times when we want to build, we look at the benchmark. We look at the yardstick that who is against us, right? I'm going to compete with against whom, right? And we start building the concept. So while we are building it, I said we will not.